we'll just give it like one and a half more minutes. But here's Cindy and Lindsay, yay. I was on mute. I mean, the name of your money to have me start telling side. Just let me know. Okay. Um, yeah, why, why don't we go ahead? I want to respect people's time, um, although I expect other people will pop in, um, hopefully, including my co presenter. So, why don't, but why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so, welcome everyone to this. Um, training that we're doing on rules and regulations, which I know is the topic that everyone is so excited to talk about. Um, and, and it actually is really fun if you wanna get into this. If you wanna do advocacy, this is one way to do it that's really, really, really fun. Um, and we like to, we time this deliberately to be right after the legislative session. And the reason is, is because often people think that, you know, okay, you, you often hear in advocacy circles, well, how many bills did you pass? Um, and the answer is it doesn't matter um, because if they don't get implemented, it's just, it, it's, um, you know, it's useless. So passing a law is just one, it's just really the first piece of the advocacy work. And then after the bill, there has to be, there has to be regulations. Uh, now, regulations are not the only, uh, Legislation is not the only reason you do regulations. Regulations get done for a whole bunch of different reasons, and they can be a really powerful advocacy tool. A lot of times the stuff that we want to get done, we want to get done. Um, we can get done with regulations. It doesn't have to be through legislation, and it's easier to change a rule um, at the state level. I want to be really clear about that, not at the federal level, at the state level than it is to change a law. Um, it is certainly possible to change rules at the federal level, but it is much, much more difficult. So um, you can go to the next. It's also a way to hold systems accountable um, is by having rules. So what we're going to do, what we're going to talk about tonight is what is a regulation? Um, who decides when we regulate? What is our state regulatory process? We're gonna talk about the Colorado Administrative Procedures Act, which is again, a much, much more exciting advocacy tool than the title would have you believe. And then advocacy tactics around regulation. We're also gonna be joined by Joe Domlin from the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, who's gonna talk about it from the perspective of being inside a state agency. Because obviously as, out, as, as independent advocates, we only know it from outside of a state agency. So it's important to know how they see it as well, because the because it's always going to be run by an agency. Um, I do, uh, when I talk in public, um, in person, I always tell people that I have a visible disability that people can see because I use a wheelchair. But I also have a hidden disability and that's that I'm from the East Coast, so I can talk really fast. So if I start talking too fast, just someone can just yell out to slow down. There's this new feature on, I think it's Microsoft Teams. When you're doing a presentation, something pops out and tells you you're talking too fast. And when that feature's on, it does it to me like all the time. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's both illuminating as a speaker and also a little creepy. Um, but feel free, I'd much rather hear it from a human than a computer if I'm talking too fast. Or if I go over a concept and no one knows, if you don't know what it is, I'm sure there are other people who don't know what it is. So I think I failed to start by introducing myself. Um, so I'm, I'm Julie Riskin, I'm one of the co-directors and the other co-director, Hillary Jorgensen is here and she's running the slides. Um, and, and the reason we're doing this is regulatory advocacy is a huge piece of the work that we do at CCDC. Um, we probably do, um, we do, we do a lot of legislative work, but we probably do more regulatory work. Um, and most of our regulatory work is with the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, but we also work with human services and the um, occasionally other entities like the Department of um, Public Health and Environment or um, 
the Department of Labor. So if you could go to the next slide. So, no, nope, back one. So what is a regulation? A regulation is really just a fancy word for rules. Um, and what is a rule? Um, so it's a small group. So people could either speak up or put in the chat. Um, we all live with rules in our lives. Um, and so regulation, again, is a rule that is, you know, kind of put in writing and formalized by the by a, some government entity. But we all have rules in our jobs and in our and in our families, right? So can someone think of a rule that a, a type of policy that everyone who works has? Every job has it. What's it called? It, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. When you get a job, you sign it, then you lose it. And then when you're mad at your boss, you're frantically trying to find it to, to see what they did wrong. Um, or you're, you're trying to, or you, you might want to look at it to see if you have a certain day off. What are those called? Okay. Handbook. Employee handbook. What, what, what did you say? Someone? An employee handbook. An employee handbook, yeah, it's um, yeah, contract sometimes at certain levels, um, and, and a lot of times people call them like your personnel policies. But and so that that's an example really of what a rule is. Um, now at the government level, there it's it's formalized and there's a process that we'll talk about later. Even in our families, we have rules. Um, if um, everyone, if you think about it, you have a rule that you have in your family. Um, I know, and. Our family, one of the rules that we had um, for our kids was no, um, you could not alter your body, like meaning tattooing, before you were 18. Um, you, could, you couldn't do anything like permanently altering your body before you were 18. And that was a rule that we had in our family. Of course, both of them then immediately inked up the minute they were 18. But every family has a rule. And again, the, the kind of the, the lower you get and the more micro you get, the more, the less formal the rules are, but it's, but a rule is something that's understood. When it's a government rule, it has to be in writing. It can't just be understood. The other thing that government can't do is they can't say, this is the rule because I said so, which as parents, we get to do. Doesn't always work very well, but we get to do that. To some extent, bosses get to do that, but not 100% because the Department of Labor has rules that says, both on the federal and state level, that says as an employer, this is what you can and cannot do. So for an example, as an employer, you can't just not pay someone. That's against the law. Um, you can, as an employer, decide what the hours are going to be. And then the higher up you get, when, when it's the government implementing stuff, they really have to follow a lot of rules and processes in order to, to make these rules. And that's, what we're, that's really what we're gonna talk about tonight is, is, the, is the rules that the government has to follow. So a couple things to remember. Um, so um, policies, again, is just a rule, any kind of rule, again, you know, family rule, workplace rule, uh, stores, you know, you, people have seen the signs on stores that say no shoes, no service, um, you know, or no pets allowed except service dogs. Those are those are policies or at, at a business. So those are the lowest level. Regulations are, are, are over that. They're written and formalized at the state or local or federal level. And then laws are the highest level. So, um, but a law in, in each level, like regulation will have more details than rules. I mean, in law, and um, often the policies like at the workforce level will um, get into even more detail. The other thing to remember is um, federal is over state and state is over local. So if there's a, so the example I always use for this is the minimum wage. There's a federal minimum wage. The state, no state could go below the federal minimum wage, but the state can go above the federal minimum wage. No local, community can go below the state minimum wage, but you can go above the state minimum wage. So for example, the state, the federal minimum wage is something ridiculous. Like, I don't even know what it is, but it's ridiculous. We have a state minimum wage that's a little bit less ridiculous. Um, it's higher. And then in some municipalities like Denver have a much higher minimum wage. 
so that's an example of that, that hierarchy. Um, I want to introduce Joe Domlin, who joined. Um, Joe is the legislative liaison for um, HICPUF, the Healthcare Policy and Financing, which is our Medicaid agency. Um, yes, Jessica. And so she is also going to be co-presenting with me. So yes, policy, regulations, then law. Um, you can look at it either way. And then you could also, if you're doing it that way, you can say local, state, federal. I sometimes do little triangle like pyramids to do this, but you can really look at it either way. Um, but that's a good a good question. Um, so uh, next slide. So we're going to talk about so who decides if we're going to regulate at all. Um, a lot of times you'll hear politicians talk about uh, regulations as if they're always bad. Um, people, we don't need more government regulation. So how people, how many, is there anyone here who's not heard some politicians say that? We don't need government, we don't need more government regulations. There's too many government regulations. That's kind of a, a catchphrase that a lot of politicians use. And sometimes what happens is that government can overregulate. Sometimes what happens is government underregulates. So the, in Colorado, we have a process to decide um, two things. One is, does something need to be regulated? And then the second, and that's sunrise, and I'll talk about that. And then there's sunset, which is looking at, is a law still useful? So in terms of a sunrise, that, that says, does a profession or an industry need regulation at all? Um, and to do that, you have to do a, you have to go to the department of, we have a whole department of regulatory agencies and you have to go to them. They have a whole office that deals with rules and you have to submit an application for a sunrise review. And in that application, you have to describe what the problem is you're trying to solve. Are there existing regulations in place? If, if so, why aren't they working? Um, it, who would be hurt by it? And they they always want to know like, would a business be hurt? Um, are consumers being hurt by lack of regulation? Is there harm to the public? And if there's harm to the public, would that harm be mitigated by regulation? So CCDC did a sunrise review yeah. a few years ago, and what we what we our sunrise and when you do a sunrise review, they offer you saying, do you want to ask for licensure, which is the strictest form? Do you want to ask for um, certification or just um, registration? Jessica, you had a question. Yeah, I think this is really good for me to know. So say if I'm wanting to advocate for more like, like special education things to be followed or maybe some more regulation, would this be an ideal thing to do to start if I am wanting to bring something to change? Is the sunrise um, the application part? It, it would kind of depend um, if if it's some if if it's let's just say there's a class of special educate just for argument's sake a class of people that work in special ed that are not regulated like special ed teachers I believe are regulated teacher all teachers are regulated but let's just say there's some group of people that work there that are not regulated then it would make sense like paras I don't think there's a lot of training on paras. Okay, so yeah, and I don't I don't know sped law that much, but it, but assuming that they weren't regulated, that might be something to say. In Colorado, we think this group of people should be you know certified, licensed, or registered or something. Um, we did we went through this process actually a few years ago. We asked for regulation on host homes. Um, for people who don't know, host homes are um, places residential places where people with developmental disabilities live. Um, okay, so someone says paras are regulated at the state and district levels. So we'll talk about what you do when someone is regulated and it's not working, because that that's that's a big part of what we do too. But right now, let's talk about someone who's not who's who, who's who might be regulated but not regulated. Well, I think there are people that argued that host homes were regulated. We would argue that they're not. Um, and so we we did a and so what we had to prove was was, and so what happens is DOOR does this whole study. Um, they take your application and if you do an application and you get it in by a certain date, and I think it's October 1st, they have to evaluate it. They can't say we're not dealing with it. They have to evaluate it and they have to give a report. So 
now you can go right to legislation and ask legislators to do to run a regular a bill to regulate an industry but if you have not gone through the sunrise process it's probably not going to be successful um so in our case they did this whole review you know we had a lot of people who had been dealt with host homes talked to them we gave and they'll ask you to give everyone interested so we gave them the name of the provider association that lobbies for them they talked to people at the state, they talked to our people, they gave a report and the report indicated horrifying abuse and death and really bad treatment. Um, and they outlined a number of cases in the report. And then they said, but we don't, we're not gonna recommend regulation because we don't think it would help, um, which we we did not agree with, but that was, that was what came out. Most sunrise reports do not result in them recommending regulation. I remember years ago they were looking at, um, and they finally did get it done, but they were looking at regulating um, sign language interpreters. And they they decided there was no harm in sign language interpreters not being regulated. And their whole rationale for this was that there were no complaints by deaf people to the Better Business Bureau. The Better Business Bureau had no accessibility for deaf people to communicate with them. Um, so it, so Dora, I would not say Dora is, um, high on disability cultural competency. Um, but, um, one of their points that was valid is that there are regulations right now for host homes and those regulations are not followed. And I think that was a valid point, which is the net, which is, I think, um, what, um, I, I believe was Jessica was getting to, which is, if if someone is regulated and, it, and and people are still being harmed, then what do you do? That's that's also a place where you wouldn't it wouldn't be a sunrise or sunset process, but it would go through just going to a state agency and demanding more regulation. So, but the sunrise is when you're starting, and then the sunset. A lot of bills, a lot of laws have a sunset, and the sunset is a date at which. It is going, you are going to relook at is this law still needed? Um, often, if you're trying to pass a law and there's question about if it's needed, there will be a sunset. Some, some legislators like a sunset just as good practice, just to say we shouldn't have forever laws. So sometimes that's a preference of the sponsor of the legislator. And sometimes it's just a way, something that you can see to get the bill passed. But what they do, and, and so Dora also does a whole study with sunset reviews. And in each of these sunset and sunrise, there's a big public input process. So it's a place where we can always have a say. Dora contacts us for a lot of different sunset reviews, um, some of which are things that we have nothing to do with, but they, if it even looks like disability, they'll contact all the different groups. Um, and so in a sunset, they ask, is this law still useful? Because sometimes laws are just no longer useful um, or not even relevant anymore. Um, it what should change, if anything, and when should we review it again? And so again, if there are concerns about the law, about the pro, sometimes it's a program. If there are concerns about the program, they might say we're going to review it again in three years. Or if there's some changes they're asking for, they might say five years, so that to see if the changes work. If it's running pretty smooth, but they still want to have a sunset, it might be seven, ten. I've even seen them go as long as fifteen years, um, where they where they'll put it, they'll just keep a sunset date on it because they feel like it's the right thing to do. Um, is that expected time noted anywhere to reevaluate? Yes, it'll be in the sunset report and it'll be in the sunset legislation. Every sunset when a, something sunsets, there's always going to be legislation that comes through um, that process. And so there'll be a bill and you'll see a lot of them and they're, they're, they often come early in the session, but not always. And it'll be, you know, in a, the bill will be sunset, you know, whatever. So this year, one of the programs that went through sunset was the Commission for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing and Deaf Blind. Um, there is a lot of drama going on there with that program. Um, the, but the sunset didn't really deal with that. It dealt with, um, just a couple things and it ended up and the bill ended up not even really dealing as much with those things but it was really the, it really focused a lot on should should the state 
should there be centralized ac accommodations within, like, should we kind of budget it all in one place or should each agency budget their own? But in terms of, is there a need for a commission for people who are deaf, hard of hearing or deaf blind? Yes, that was needed. The programs that they have, like the rural interpreter program, the legal interpreter program, and the supportive services program for deaf blind, were all seen as, as important, good programs that need to continue and expand. Um, but the, but I think there's some drama in terms of like how things are run. Um, that's so that those are the kinds of things. When you have a concern about a program, a sunset review is a really good place to raise it, particularly at the DORA level. But if for some reason that doesn't happen, you can still raise it at the legislative level. It's just much more effective to raise it during the sunset process. Um, you'll get a copy of this presentation. The DORA is the Division Department of Regulatory Agencies. Thank you for that. Um, and that's a state agency. Um, and all rules pass through there at some point. Um, Joe's going to talk a little bit more about how that intersects you know, how, how when the state is in another state agency like Medicaid is doing a rule, how that is going to connect with DORA. Thank you. Um, Joe just put the website in the chat. And when you get a copy of this presentation, which you'll get afterwards, the sunrise and sunset are both linked. So you can look at them and you can read previous sunrise and sunset reports. Uh, I'm, given how, how many they do, there will be some that are interesting to you. So there's some groups that are always trying to get um, regulated and, and often professions want to get regulated because it's a financial benefit. If you, it, it causes exclusivity. So for example, I'm part of a regulated profession, which is social work, and, and that governs who can say they're a social worker. And so if you've gone to school for something and you've taken a test and you subscribe to a code of ethics, you don't necessarily want anyone to just say that they're that thing. And so that applies to uh, you know, tons of professions, like all kinds of healthcare, plumbers, electricians, um, barbers, um, nail technicians, all kinds of professions are regulated. So we can go to the next slide. So um, Joe is going to take over from here and talk about what is it like from the state perspective after the legislative session? What happens? How, how do the rules get made? So, um... Hi, everybody. And I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. I was stuck on a, another call. So um, thanks for inviting me, Julie. It's I've At certain times, I've participated in these trainings at different levels. So it's nice to be here tonight. And thanks for taking the time to learn about all this stuff. It's, um, it's not, I guess it's just rules and regulations. And when you think about it, you want to think about how laws sometimes aren't very specific. And so when we start thinking about implementation, it's like, what in the what in that bill might cause confusion? But um, since we are right at the end of everything being over for 2024, I, I wanted to come and just share a few things. But to give you a sense for a big department like healthcare policy and financing, we followed about 65 bills. And at the end of the day, 45 bills in the legislative session this year affect our agency. So everything has been signed that was going to be signed. The governor, after the legislature ends, the governor has 30 days to sign what he's going to sign and, or not sign and let things pass without signature or veto. So that time has passed. So Officially, I always like to wait till that very last day to say that this session is fully over, just to make sure there aren't any surprises or changes that we don't know about. But um, once that happens, an agency really, the session's over and we really take over in the process because the agencies are built, the executive branch is the implementation branch. The legislature makes the laws and we implement the laws. And so with that, we what we do at HICPUF is we take every bill that affects us and we do an evaluation of it just to make sure that some amendment didn't get on there that we didn't know about or a lot can happen throughout that process. Little things 
that you might miss. And one word in a build can make a huge difference. Um, and so we take each bill after it's signed to make sure we have the final version. And then we identify bill leads. The bill leads create teams. And then they have to identify those teams and what are all the steps that the agency has to go through to make sure a bill is implemented correctly. Um, that could be a bill could have that we have to create an advisory group. Well, are those people appointed by our executive director? Are they appointed by the governor? Are they just selected by application? All those details, or maybe we evaluate not every bill Every new law will not require rules, regulations. So we won't do rulemaking on every bill. So we do that, that evaluation, sort of identifying the key elements in each bill and what it's going to take to implement that. Then we look across the department to our different offices. Um, is there a systems change? We have huge systems as a big public health insurance program we have a lot of technology that we have to implement. So does a bill require a systems change? Then that involves that team. Does it involve rulemaking? That's our legal team. Does it involve a communication plan? Um, for whatever reason, maybe it's, it's working with a certain population that we don't do as much outreach to as others. So we have to figure that all out. So all those things we have to look. And then we have to look at, are there other state agencies involved in this bill with whom we need to work? So is the Department of Public Health, is there an angle there? Um, how about the Department of Human Services? We've had a lot with the new Behavioral Health Administration. What does that look like? So thinking about where all the other agencies land with a particular bill. And then to get to the heart of tonight, it's rulemaking identified, do we need to do rules? And as Julie said, um, laws trump rules and rules need a law before they can be drafted and promulgated. Promulgation is the official word to have something, have a bill, have a rule go all the way through the process. So um, there has to be some law that we attach a rule to. We can't just make, we do have general authority to write rules and that is in the law. And sometimes that is um, necessary, but many times a bill will say, the department shall promulgate the rules to implement this law. And so that gives us the legal authority to do the regulations. And oftentimes where we start is we start by looking at the effective dates on a bill. It's really important that we have that end goal in mind because sometimes if it's a very quick effective date, then we have to do an emergency rule. And that might not go through as, it'll be um, an instant regulation that will then later be, go through the regular process. But there might be a law that needs us to, to specify something very quickly. And so we take care of those knowing that then we have a longer process for those. So we really have to keep an eye on the effective dates because the rulemaking process takes four to six months from the very beginning to the end when it is posted by the Secretary of State and it becomes official. So we have to look at their schedule and we sort of go to the end and then go backwards to figure out our schedule for it. Anything other on that, Julie, before I move on from your perspective? Can you give an example of a rule that has to be passed immediately? Um, I knew you, one thing I didn't do today was look at some, um, if there was something that really affected the safety of 
our members in a particular way. I'm trying to think um, maybe it is access to a, a certain procedure or... Um, Wasn't the public health emergency one? Yeah, I mean, the public health emergency, we had um, some definite rules about, around telehealth. That's mm -hmm. a good example. We had to do some emergency rules to say that people were going to be reimbursed for telehealth. Thank you for thinking of that. Um, and then later we had to go and make those permanent rules. But that's a good example. But sometimes it's merely by um, the reason is because the bill is effective upon signature. It's not going to be effective in the regular three months, um, but it's it has a what we call a safety clause on it, and it says it must be implemented immediately and go into effect. And those can be very important, but they really put a pinch on the implementation because we are the minute it is signed, we are already behind. Like okay. And we try to prepare for that. But um, usually it's something that really pushes us. I used to work at DORA, and I can think of all sorts of examples we did there um, in the regulatory space. But um, to do an emergency rule, it's just something that usually it really deals with safety or it's going to really affect providers in a big way. So that type of thing. So the steps, I talked a little bit about this and I think Julie, you're gonna go into this in more detail about how the law dictates this. But as I said, at the beginning, there's a decision to do a rule or modify an existing rule. And rules are typically um, to provide more specificity, to make more specifics about something in a bill. So a good example was we had a bill that dealt with um, chronic disease, and it had to do with access to certain, um, I'm not remembering the details, but we worked with the Chronic Care Collaborative on it. It was two years ago, or last year, Julie, it, and it was very similar to a bill this year that provides um, access without prior auths to antipsychotic drugs this year. And last year, it had to do with um, doing like putting into law our prior approval process to make sure that another administration won't change it because we have certain things about 24 hour turnaround on right. our prior authorization. And so it, it made a statement in there about um, advanced conditions or serious conditions so that language was really vague. I'm, and that, I mean, that's I'm, a really good point because sometimes what will happen is we'll create a practice at the state level with an agency and then we decide we like it and we then want to make it a law to make sure that another administration doesn't undo it because it's easier to change a, 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 a rule than a law. So yeah. we were kind of talking about, you know, you run a piece of legislation and then it gets put into rule, but we also do it the other way. Yeah. And you, there's always a risk there because once you put something into law, it can be really hard to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes both ways. So um, sometimes um, you don't want to put things that are super specific into a law, right. um, but it does go both ways on a process. And so that was a case where the language in the bill was just vague. So we worked very hard with the sponsors of that bill and with the Chronic Care Collaborative and others, I think CCDC was probably involved in that as well, to make sure that the rule language was exactly how we had negotiated it with the bill. And it took us a while to get there, but in the end we got there. And I think it was a good negotiation. But you negotiate on the bills and the legislation through the legislative session, and you also negotiate on rules. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really where you all come in. But then there's a formal part of this. There, it has to be public, publicly noticed with the Secretary of State. There must be public engagement and research on a rule. Um, and then there is always a public hearing on every rule. 
before it receives final um, approval and a final vote and is passed. Yeah. And with, with Medicaid, with the healthcare policy and financing, they do two readings of a rule, but the law only requires one reading. Mm -hmm. So some, so every agency has a different process. I think the ones that are more involved with our, with the community tend to have, they're more experienced at working with us. So like they tend to make it easier to sign up, easier to testify, have two hearings. Now they might do a consent agenda if like no one cares. Like every year they do a rule, they do a rule to increase all of the financial limits because social security goes up. Well, no one's going to oppose that. I mean, like it's just going to happen. So like that's one where they might just the second time it's on consent agenda and they don't really talk about it. But anything that's at all controversial, like even if it's not controversial, but there's questions, there'll always be two two hearings. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize something that you mentioned, Julie. Like, every, every agency has to go to the Administrative Procedure Act, but every agency is different. So, it, you know, if, there's, if the issue you're really interested in happens to cover, it, like, more than one agency, <laughs> has some authority over the issue. Like you don't assume that HIPAA's rulemaking process is an Department of Human Services rulemaking process is the same as um, public health and environment rulemaking process. Um, I worked at DORA for 13 years. And I mean, at HIPAA, you have one big board, the Medical Services Board. And, you know, DORA has, I. We used to count them up. What are they up to now? How many boards? I I've lost over a hundred, I would think. I um, but there are many different. It, it's a variation on a theme, to use a musical analogy. That it, it's sort of like you've got the Administrative Procedures Act, um, and generally that guides in a very specific way, but you can go beyond that to make it more accessible, um, which was an eye-opener for me. The first time I went to a HICPUP rulemaking, I was like, what is going on over here? Because <laughs> I'd been in Dora for so long. So um, it's just an interesting process. So this sort of show you the formal. And then Howard, and I know that Julie's going to go in this in more detail, but how are the rules made? Well, it's through the Administrative Procedures Act. And an agency is always involved, and there will always be a notice and comment period. But I wanted to go to the next slide because it is specific to HICPAF. And this just gives you a little bit of an idea. And this is a very busy slide, so I apologize. But um, it gives you a sense, and that little gauge at the bottom, sort of where you can have the biggest impact when it comes to rulemaking. And my advice is get involved early and often. As I told you, the first thing when bills pass, we, we develop a bill lead. And there are different people in our department that then will be what we call the rule author. And those are our subject matter experts. And rulemaking is really, really important. Some people say it's more important than the even passing laws because that old, good old phrase, the devil's in the details. Well, the details occur in the rules. And so small showing up matters and participation matters. And I am a person with a disability. Um, and I can tell you, we want people with disabilities to be involved. We affect we, many, many of our members have disabilities and it's really important that the voice is heard and understood and a variety. Not all disabilities are alike. That's the other um, challenge we all face. So I just wanna encourage you to not think this is a, a process that um, is too big or too foreign or too, you know, it's your right to participate and it's important and we want you to. Um, but those early stages with the rule author, those are early 
efforts to get information, um, to get that information from stakeholders. So number one and two on that gauge, where you're just starting to put the rule together, um, thinking about what that might be and giving some very tangible information. Um, typically the rule authors have stakeholder lists. For instance, the Office of Community Living, I'm sure Julie is on the top of their stakeholder list. Um, and But many, many different types from all of the different types of groups are on those lists to make sure it's a broad perspective of input. Um, but then it gets starts going through a more formal, so you've got a draft bill, then it goes to the Department of Regulatory Agencies. And then it is put um, in the hands of the Medical Services Board, which we call the MSB. That coordinator uploads the draft bill into DORA. And then you start seeing people signing up on their email list to receive notifications of what's going on with that document. So it is at HICPUB, but DORA, the same, um, the same division in DORA that does all those sunrises and sunsets that I sent that link to, they also review all the rules. And their, their acronym is called COPPER, and it's the Colorado Office of Policy Research and Regulatory Reform. And so that's, look over that webpage because they do both. And it's important because they're sort of tracking it. But you can call, and on that website, you'll see a name of Chris Sykes. And he is the MSB coordinator. And he can put you on his email list so that when um, the public rule review meeting happens, which is number five here, this is a public rule review meeting. This isn't one of the two hearings that Julie talked about. This is literally a very different type of opportunity for people to give their input. So there are really multiple areas that you can do it and we want that input. And then it goes into a more formal, the, um, the yes, you would, on the website I put, in that was it's i'm going to show you a slide with our website that you can go on you want to give your name to the msb coordinator who is chris sykes and you can probably julie maybe you can put his email in the chat that would be great yeah i will and i think um someone remind me at the end to go over because like there's a lot of different places you can sign up for things um, yeah and so we can also follow up with that, but I'll put some of that in the chat now. Yeah, thank you, Hillary. Appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to go over this a little bit. So there are lots of places you could come in and the rulemaking, um, but I also want, let's go to the next slide. I also want to provide this website. This has a list of all the different areas in which you might be able to um, get involved. And it may be that you, the rulemaking obviously, and that's that's on there and you can get involved and you'll, you'll find more information about the Medical Services Board. But we have lots of advisory groups. We have lots of different stakeholder engagement um, projects going on. And so if sort of the formal rulemaking Administrative Procedures Act isn't your gig, although you're here and you need to learn about it, and it's really important, we have lots of opportunities. So I just wanted to encourage you to check us out. You can always talk to me. Julie knows where to find me. Hillary knows where to find me. Um, but it's not, um, we're an accessible agency in many ways, and we want your input, and we want people to understand what we do and how we do it and we won't get everything 100% right 100% of the time. Um, but I can tell you, I work with a lot of really smart people and they are working very hard, especially, um, I know you work a lot with Office of Community Living. So that is my spiel. Did I miss anything, Julie? 
No, this was helpful. And I, I was just, um, you know, the whole thing of who is a stakeholder, someone put that in the chat and that's anyone that's involved that a rural effect. So that could really be anyone. And mm -hmm. often we are talking as advocates about equity and stakeholdering because the provider, you know, the people who make money off of this often have a lot of paid lobbyists and people mm -hmm. who do this, you know, and we're mostly relying on volunteers and community members. So we're, we are often, but it's important to get involved early um, and often because they will be at the table. And, you know, Elizabeth Warren said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that is so true. So it, it's really important that we be at the table. And once we're at the table, I do feel like we're heard. Um, it's, there are places in government, and I don't feel like Hickbuff is one of them, where like the client view was just totally disregarded. Um, and, but I feel like when we're at the table, we do have an equal say. So, um, I, I mean, you could, someone could full-time go to stakeholder meetings at Hickpuff. Like they could do that 40, like more than 40 hours a week and do absolutely nothing else. There are enough opportunities that you could literally, they, and there's like a calendar. Um, like, so you, you know, like, there, there's more, way more meetings than you could possibly do. And, and we are, we are hiring people specifically to organize our stakeholdering full time. Right. So yeah, I met take, some of them recently. So take, take advantage of yeah. it and give feedback if you're not being heard. Don't sit in silence. Please let us know. Yeah. So, um, and then, and that's just. Medicaid that so there's still the whole behavioral health administration, which also has a number of committees and then a lot of the contractors that work with Medicaid, like the regional accountable entities that man are supposed to manage mental health and, and primary care. And then all of the case management agencies, all of them have to have committees. So like there is plenty to do. <laughs> um, if you want to do this work. So thank and do, do people have other questions for Joe. Um, yeah, Jerrica, I was actually going to, uh, can you put your email in the chat? Cause I definitely want to talk to you. Um, I saw you mentioned Western slope and yeah, I I'm really trying to cultivate the way out here, um, to educate people because it blows my mind how many people think their voice doesn't matter and it does. And that's how we make changes. And so I, I really want to, yeah, I would love to connect. Yeah. Cause we, we can definitely connect you with some stuff that we're doing out there. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Joe before, because I think Joe has other things to do, so. It's been cut me loose. Well, thank you so much for letting me come tonight. Thank you. And please um, let me know what you need. And like I said, get involved early yeah. and often. We want to hear from you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So Hillary, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so the Administrative Procedures Act is um, really, really cool. Um, and so I don't know if you can put that link in the chat, but um, it is, um, I, I think it's fun to, for people to just open it up and see if you can find an advocacy opportunity in there. Um, because um, I think it's linked right to that rule that if you you what you want to do is you want to go um down to rulemaking which is 244103 so I'm just, i can't copy it but i can oh, i can oh, open I, it and i can show my i can copy it and put it in the chat okay. um, so if, if people can open it that would be great um and I just want to see if someone can find an advocacy opportunity here. Or something that maybe you think that not every state agency is doing.
so when you're when you're doing this kind of work you you if you feel like a process isn't going well you want to look back um yeah sorry you want to go to 244103 um it, you just scroll down a little bit um when you're doing rulemaking what you want to do is you want to look for um if it's not going well particularly you want to go look at this act and see are they doing everything that they are supposed to do? One of the things that is really important, um, it's 24.4.103, rulemaking procedure definitions. Um, um, you wanna make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. One thing that we find a lot is all of a sudden, um, a rule is being interpreted one way and then all of a sudden it's being interpreted another way. When that happens, um, we've had, we've actually had this happen in Medicaid quite a few times. Where um, an example is for long term care. Um, when you're evaluated for long term care, the for forever it's been that your mobility is evaluated without respect to device. Um, with that, with, that there's you're not they don't consider a device. So if you use a wheelchair, they consider your mobility needs without the wheelchair um, or whatever it is that you're using. Um, so it, um, I'll just put this in the chat. Um, so, so they, so so if for, so for example, if someone is doesn't have the use of their legs and they use a power chair well they could probably get around just fine with the power chair but they're assessed as if they can't move at all because without the power chair which medicaid buys they can't move or a prosthetic or whatever so all of a sudden we started getting these complaints of people being assessed the other way of saying you don't get any points for mobility because you get around fine with your prosthetic your wheelchair whatever and it was someone interpreted something differently well, we were able to use this to go back and say, no, 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 you have to go through medical services board if you're going to reinterpret something. So, um, so they knew that if it went to medical services board that we would organize and turn out a ton of people and create a ton of drama. And so they dropped it um, and, did it and, and ended up going back to the original interpretation. But it's important to know this stuff so that when someone, because sometimes someone just interprets something because they're new and they don't know and or they're trying to get away with something it's really important that it get interpreted um in a in a proper way um and that in going through medical services board is another place where we can do advocacy um and so that's important another advocacy opportunity here is the interested person list so it says the agency, so every agency has to, it says it shall establish a representative group of participants with an interest in the subject of the rulemaking um, to participate informally. So that means the agency cannot, by law, they're not allowed to just sit in their desks and make up a rule. They have to talk to people it affects. And that's that's clients, it's also you know the vendors or providers, but they can't just do it without talking to people. Now, there's always the question of like, who do they talk to and how do they do the outreach? And those are all things we can advocate on. Um, they also have to, for every bill, analyze things. They have to say, what's the reason? What are the benefits? What are the costs? Are there any adverse effects on anyone? And then they also have to say, what are the options, including not doing a rule? So sometimes it'll the analysis will say, well, the option of not doing a rule is we'll be in violation of federal law so we're not going to do that. But sometimes it's like, well, we could not do a rule. Um, yes, and that's that's correct, Jerrica. That would be the arrow chart. Um, and it also says that they're supposed to put this stuff on a website. I think we could argue with a lot of state agencies that while it might be on the website, it's not easy to find. Um, there are also some rules that can be done through the executive director, not a board. But they still have to have a comment. They still, you still have to be able. They still have to have a hearing, um, and they also have to publicize the hearing. And then, um, so that that's what the process is. There's also something in the Administrative Procedures Act, and I'll admit we've never totally been able to figure out how to make this happen. But where citizens can come together and ask for a rule, 
um, like there's a formal process. We have certainly been doing that on a, just by asking for it, but we've never actually done a formal process to, to petition for a rule, but there is a way to do that. So, um, so, and so, so I would just spend some time playing around with that. Um, and Jerrica, yeah, we would be happy to mentor you on this because it does, I know we're going through it really fast and it does take some time to figure all of this out. But if you could go to the next slide. Um, so what are the advocacy opportunities? Um, you know, one is, like I said, you can propose a rule. You can say, so how many times have you been dealing with something with the state? And you say, there should be a rule. Well, we get to have a say in that. And there are lots and lots of rules that we have helped make. Um, for example, there's a rule in Medicaid eligibility that says, if someone gets Medicaid, I'm not saying the words exactly, I'm saying the concept. If someone gets Medicaid or continues Medicaid and they were not eligible, and but it was not due to their dishonesty, it was due to the system, which we all know how lovely our system is. It'll, you know, give, a, you know, it'll give, um, you know, Jeff Bezos Medicaid sometimes because it, it just doesn't always work, that they cannot recover. Um, we recently have now gotten it where they've changed the rules to say they will not ask for back pay, even on benefits cases, um, even on like if you, if they, there's been a lot of issues with um, parent CNAs um, where they were trying to kind of cut people off and then people were appealing. And so we now have it that if you appeal and lose, they're not gonna recover. For a long time, that was the practice and we got that in the rule. Um, so, so one opportunity is to propose rules, is to say, we need a rule that says this. And often, again, when there's a practice that we like, we want it in rule because we don't want the next person to come undo it. Sometimes though, what we wanna do is we wanna stop a rule. A rule is coming forward and either we think it's a bad idea or we think that we're not ready for it. Recently, we did this um, when they were implementing the new assessment, the long-term care case management rules. We blocked them several times before we felt like it was right um, because there were things, one of the big issues that we had that we really fought over and we got our way, we got it in the rule, is to when they went to the case management agency is to say people should be able to opt out and go to a different case management agency if that other case management agency will accept them. <laughs> now, I will admit this is not as relevant in the rural areas but where you don't have that many and often, um, but for example, in Denver, you know, we have, oh, it is um, in some parts of the rural areas. In some areas, it's just too far to have any choice. But for example, Montrose Delta, there's two different agencies that one's in Montrose, one's in Delta. Um, and there's a different agency serving at um, Arapaho and Denver. So if you really can't deal with one agency, you should be able to ask to go to another one. They didn't want that. We fought really hard for that because our members told us that was really important. Um, um, someone just put in the text that it would be nice to have a longer period to appeal. Well, we actually passed a law and then we got rules doing that where you do have 60 days to appeal. Now there's a whole training on appeals that I'm not gonna get into. So sometimes you have less than that, but we did extend the time to appeal. Um, and, um, and, and, and have some grace periods in there. So, um, and if that isn't enough, um, if, if, um, if, that, if that amount of time isn't enough, then that's something we can go back and look at doing more. Um, but that's, um, so that would be the next thing, which is to amend the rules. Um, and amending the rules might be, we know there has to be a rule on this, but we want the rule to say something that, you know, again, we don't think 60 days is enough. A lot of the rules on eligibility deal with days, like what's a reasonable opportunity to correct an application? Um, how much notice should someone get before something? Um, so, um, so I think, so Jerrica put in the chat, local DHS gives us 10 days. There are, they are, and then again, that they're often giving you 10 days to just um, to respond to something. Uh, and they're, but they are supposed to give you more time than that to fill out an eligibility packet. So that's a great, a great example of why you need to know what the rules are. Because um, if, 
if you fill out an eligibility packet and then they need another piece of information, 10 days might be reasonable, but they should also say, if you need help, here's who you call. Or if you say, I need more time, they should honor that depending on how hard or easy it is to get the thing that they're asking. We're getting a lot of complaints about people asking for you know, a bank account from 1985, which is not something that's easy to get, or you know, what happened to a car that you had 15 years ago. Um, and so, yeah, so knowing what you can and can't do, what they can and can't ask um, is really um, important. And yes, also to ask, you can always ask for reasonable accommodations just to access the process. So if you are getting stuff in print and you need it electronically, or if you, um, if you can't, if you have like a cognitive disability and you can't access encrypted emails, you can ask that stuff be sent in a different way is just a couple little examples. Um, so amending rules are really important. So often when a rule comes out, we look at it and we like to have lots of people look at it to say, what is it that we don't like about this? Now, just like with the law, some things, there might be a big rule and it might be that they're only changing a certain section. And that's really what we can comment on. That's really what we could change in that setting, but we can also use that time to say, here are some things that we're gonna, um, that we, we know is not in this rulemaking, but that we don't like, and we're gonna comment on and ask that it be brought up at another time. And the reason you wanna do that, knowing they're not gonna change it is because they have, they keep what they call, some of the times they call it listening logs or public comment diaries or something like that. And they can then be asked later, what came up in the listening log for such and such. Um, we, there was recently, again, a really large case management rule. And then um, we started hearing some stuff in the developmental disabilities arena that changed and so it was a very long listening log. There were over 300 comments filed. So we had to go through and look at every single comment to say, did we? Did any of us even see this, this one piece that we're now concerned about coming? Um, and the answer was no, there was no, not one comment in it, which means it was not discussed. Again, it was still, it was in the rule, but it was not discussed. It was not flagged as a change. Um, so we went back and said, this is a problem. We need to deal with this. Um, even though, again, it, a, a rule had already passed, so the thing we didn't like was already in the rule, but that doesn't mean that we can't say, we still want you to go back and relook at this. Sometimes when they're giant rules, um, like cause some, we just went through behavioral health rules that were like 800 pages. So we know we're gonna miss stuff, but we'll ask for, we'll ask for the, a commitment from the rulemaking board or the agency to say in a year, 18 months, once you start implementing, we want an opportunity to come back and make further changes. That's something we've learned the hard way. Um, we've learned from making mistakes that it's important to do that because we, we are gonna miss stuff when these are when they're gigantic rules. And we often don't like gigantic rules, but sometimes there's a reason to do them. Um, one of the things we do and where we could definitely use more help when they're large rules is we try and parse out pieces. So we'll maybe have a little chart and we'll say, okay, this, you know, someone just said, well, I, I have two kids with autism. So maybe if that person knows rules for early childhood, we'd say, can you look at this section that deals with that? Um, then maybe someone else would say, can you look at the eligibility piece? Can you look at the case management qualification piece? And everyone looks at a different piece. And then we come back and kind of compare notes. And then we submit comments as a large group. Um, sometimes that's a good thing to do. Sometimes it's good to have a lot of individual comments. It's a strategy decision. Um, and then, so, so we can propose rules, we can stop rules, we can amend rules. The other thing for individual advocates, um, and I thought I saw Amy on here, um, who's one of our individual advocates on the team, is we use the rules to benefit our client. Um, and so you can use the rule. And so when I say client, that could just be someone in your neighborhood you're helping. It could be anyone with a disability that you're helping. There's a lot of stuff in these rules that really, really helps us. Um, and that's really good, but we've got to know them. So for example, there are um, response times for case managers um, that are, are not being met very well right now. Um, but we, But the rule is the rule. So we can complain by saying, if you did, you know, if someone asked for an assessment for long-term care services 
in a certain amount of, I don't remember what the days are that they have to respond, but it's a certain amount of days. And it's based on the situation. Like if you're in the hospital, it's fewer days than if you're in the community, but whatever days pass and that doesn't happen, you, we can go back and say, hey, the rule said you have to do this. And then when that doesn't happen, we can go to Medicaid and say, hey, they didn't do this. The rule says, and it, and it does get tedious, but when you can point out the rules, you have a lot more leverage. When you file an appeal, the administrative law judge is only allowed to look at the rule. Um, the, that is the only thing they can look at, which is why it's important to get these rules right. So if you're filing, so let's just say you're filing an appeal. Um, and we, Amy just said, we file a lot of these. And um, someone got a notice, today is June 19th. So someone gets a notice a week from today on June 26th that says your benefits end on June 30th. Um, well, guess what? You file an appeal, client wins. Don't it doesn't even matter if they're not really eligible, client wins, why? Because the rules say, unless the client has died, you have confirmation that they've moved out of the state or they have, or they, or there's like you absolutely know and you can convict on fraud um, that you have to give 10 day advance written notice. If you get a notice on June 26, that's not 10 days before the 30th. So the judge will just rule, we win. Um, and then they have to start over give you a new notice and then you know you can decide if you're going to appeal again then you then you maybe find eventually get there on the merits we won a lot of cases like this of just no no you violated the rule we win so you can use these rules to again to benefit people um, particularly in terms of timelines but also other things uh, medical necessity rules say that there's certain things that they have to consider um, they they can't go outside of that um, so, um, so th these are the advocacy opportunities for working on rules. Can you go advance? So some advocacy opportunities in the rulemaking process. Um, so there's definitely, there's sunrise and sunset. You can get, you can ask for a sunrise. You can also participate in the sunrise. You can look on that DORA webpage and see all of the things that are under sunrise. The same thing with sunset. Um, you can be involved with sun, with um, with the sunset. You can make comment. A pre rulemaking stakeholder group. Um, you can um, you can be involved. Sometimes, like when you know a rule is coming, either because there was a law or because um, you just know about it, you can be involved um, with that. You and all you have to do is just ask to say, I wanna be notified of any meeting. Um, some You can comment on a published rule. Um, that chart that Joe gave, that's like, you know, once it's at the medical services board or even the rule review meeting, that, that it's published at that point or the medical services board. It is better to do earlier rather than later. You can lobby the governing board, which again, could be the medical services board, the human service, whatever board is, is governing that rule. And again, there's tons of these boards or the executive director to change a rule or to change the rule in the process. Jerrica, go ahead. What's your question? Sorry. Um, so when it says lobby governing board, <clears throat> I'm applying for a nonprofit 501c3 for what I'm doing out here. And I didn't know because it seems like a lot of these organizations are nonprofits. Can you speak into that at all of like the difference between like lobbying and then just advocating? I'm going to have Hillary do that because she's our expert on that. But but you can lobby as a nonprofit. We are a nonprofit and we lobby a lot. That's what I was wondering because I want to do things, but I just don't know that boundary. Yeah. Okay. This is a whole training in and of itself. Because there are a lot of exceptions. Like I literally have an hour long training right here on this. Um, but um, generally, and I'm going to preface this by saying there are a lot of exceptions. So generally, a C3 can lobby up to 10% of their budget. So, you know, your budget is $10,000, you can like spend $1,000 in kind of direct cash on lobbying. However, lobbying 
only a part of the Hibbert kind of phenomenon, the select phenomenon, classroom phenomenon, mono phenomenon, and then roommate-in. So the C3 limit only applies to elect phenomenon, classroom phenomenon, and the elect phenomenon with the voters. Rulemaking is actually considered an executive function, so there's not an IRS limit on how much you can advocate during the rulemaking process. But if you're lobbying on any bill, that is still what to lobby. Or if you're asking people to tell their legislators to vote yes or no or whatever, that's also what lobbying. That counts against your lobbying. So if you're and on then, our, yeah, if you're on our list and you get our emails that says yeah. call your leg, you know, click here to tell your legislator X, that's lobbying. Yeah. So that's my short answer, but like this is a much longer training. And I think, you know, uh if you really are concerned about this, I would like consult an attorney. There's yeah. also a good organization, the like, national organization that I will send you a link to that are like the experts in this and they do a bunch of trainings throughout the year for people. Um the trainings do cost money, but they're like twenty and thirty dollars for training. So they're not like super expensive. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's my short sure answer. Yeah. And when I'm saying lobbying, I'm really talking about so like the medical services board has members and often we'll look at, so, you know, and they have members based on each congressional district. So we might look at, okay, who's in each, con like who, like, so if there's a member, you know, in the fourth congressional district, it's like, okay, who do we know in Eastern Colorado? We need them to call that person. We need the West, um, you know, we need people on the Western slope to call this person. Um, this this member is really interested in children's issues, so we might want to ask family voices to call them, you know, and so that when I say it's like really we organize, or we also will do turnout to rulemaking board hearings. Um, so, and that that's a good lead into the next slide. Um, so, some of the tactics that we do. So there's. So, so some tactic is showing up at specific boards. Um, so a great example of this is the National Federation for, for the Blind um, for years, and they, they stopped a while during the pandemic and now they're back. They show up at every RTD board meeting, every single one, they're always there. They don't always comment, but they're always there. And just them being there means that their issues don't get forgotten about. Um, so we, for a long time, were showing up at every med medical services board meeting. They're now mostly virtual, but we probably need to get back in the habit of showing up at all of them, not just the ones where we have issues. We do read the rules for each one, but again, more volunteers that are willing to show up, even if showing up is, is virtually, um, because they need to know that we're watching them all the time. Um, then another tactic is advocating for or against a specific rule. Um, and so that um, that's something that you do at a specific meeting. Um, uh, at, you know, again, so like when we were one thing that we were advocating for with the Behavioral Health Administration, which was in front of the Human Services Board, is um, a strong like stronger grievance processes. And we were also advocating to have advocating to have more people with lived experience on the boards of these organizations that they're creating that are gonna run things. So though that would be advocating for a specific rule. Then there's kind of advocating for principles and all rules. We tend to have a, you know, our motto is nothing about us without us. And, you know, we're always advocating for like more client involvement, more client control, more client direction. Um, another thing you can do is, um, you know, when you show up, at, I want to go back to showing up at specific boards. Um, this is what we call the, the the Josh Winkler tactic and how he got, um, when we first got our Medicaid buy-in, they screwed up and they didn't have it for long-term care, which was kind of, if the, this is the program that allows people with disabilities to work and keep their Medicaid. The rule was mostly, the, that law was mostly passed with the long-term care population in mind, because that, because long-term care is what private insurance doesn't cover. 
And so they were trying to get away with doing it just for regular Medicaid and not long-term care Medicaid. And they weren't um, hearing what Josh was saying. So what Josh did and organized and got a bunch of people to do it is like anytime there was a, a meeting, a bo like any Medicaid board meeting for like any issue, any topic, he would show up or other people would show up and talk about that issue. And quite frankly, they got so sick of hearing about it that they just finally did the right thing. And that that does work. That tactic works is you keep on harping on something long enough. And it, but you've got to be really persistent. And what that means is you can't just go to that one meeting. You've got to go to every single meeting they have. And at every public comment, just go on about that one thing. But that is an effective tactic. It just takes time. So, um, and they, um, you know, they they didn't listen to him. And then and then he wanted to get on the medical services board, and they they blocked him. Well, guess what? Now he's the governor's policy advisor for all disability. So um, he gets to call them and ask them what they're doing. Um, so, it, but that but that's really what involvement can get you is like just showing up and being involved, and then people eventually realize, hey, this person's making sense. This they're right. Um, and then, you know, even if the bureaucrats aren't don't want you, there are people in the system that are there for the right reasons. In our case, it was the lieutenant governor, who is a very strong, passionate uh, member of our community. So. That's yeah, and that that is a great example of like how how this kind of work can really end up. You can really have power to make changes, and in the position he has, making those changes, he's able to do so much for our community, like so like stop so many bad things that never even hit, um, just by being in the room. Um, because so often just having, and that's why I'm so happy that Joe Donlin is at Hickpuff because I can tell you when we were fighting about wheelchair stuff and people there were not believing it was as bad as we were saying it was. Joe is a wheelchair user who was sitting in the room who's their colleague said it is that bad. And here have been my experiences that changed their attitude in a way that none of us could. Um, serving on boards, um, particularly those of you who aren't known, um, it's a good time to get on a board before you're known as an advocate. Um, you can, um, there again, there are lots and lots of boards there are, um, again, there are governor appointed boards. There's a lot of boards, some boards you get appointed by legislators. Um, I'm on a board right now where I was appointed by the judicial branch. Like you, there are all different ways to get on these boards. But if you, if someone says, you know, again, the, there'll be a link um, at the end to look at um, all of the different boards that our state has. And again, there's hundreds of them. Um, so, um, Okay, Jarek, I thought your email looked familiar because because we're I'm involved in that. So now now that I thought your email looked familiar, um, but serving on boards is a really good way to be involved. And again, there's all, there are boards on the local level, the state level. Um, it's a it's a really good way. Um, organizing for general appearance on an issue. Um, there's with all of the case management stuff. There's a lot of organization going on around case management redesign. Sometimes it, there's a whole bunch of different pieces to that. There's getting people on the local councils. There's work looking at the state rules. There's dealing with some of the transition stuff. Um, so that's, um, but ha again, having organizing and having, we're actually starting a organizing on the issue of consumer direction. We're gonna have a group that's just gonna focus on that. And we're gonna decide what rules we need changed and then go advocate. But we're gonna start with our own group just on that issue. Um, and that'll be right now, we only have consumer direction for three services. It needs to be for more and it needs to be for everyone. So that'll be, um, so that's an example of, we come together, we talk about an issue, we identify what isn't working and then we go to the state and say, let's do that. Consumer direction is um, a, a method of getting services where like it's right now, it's only for personal care and home care. Um, where you don't have to go through an agency, where you could just basically, you're assessed, you get a dollar amount, there's a fiscal agent, but the client decides who they're going to hire, what they're going to pay, when they're going to work, does all the training, does all the backup. Um, we think that model works well, and it could work for other programs, other things like supported community connection, respite, home modification, transportation. We think there's lots of things that can work for. Um, and so, um, 
and then and then also being involved in one of the work groups that Joe was talking about, like every time there's a new law, there's a work group and you can be involved. Now, sometimes those get taken over right now. Um, I'll give an example of something that is a challenge right now. We went through the sunrise process on host homes. We then passed a law that said, HICPA, you need to do regulations to, to tighten up the host home situation. They did a stakeholder process and it's not worked very well. So we might have to go back and have the legislature do something more concrete because the stakeholder process, unfortunately, is, a, you know, there'll be like 75 people on the call and maybe five to 10 of us on the client side and the rest are all providers. So the whole discussion is skewed totally towards providers. And there's all this, I made a snarky comment at the last meeting because they were talking about the due process rights of the providers. And I'm not saying people should ever be treated unfairly when they work, they shouldn't, but there was not one talk of the due process for the people who actually live in these places. Like your right to like live in a safe place and to have the needs identified in your care plan be met. Um, and so sometimes, you know, you try this and, and you, in this case, it's like one where, okay, we tried to do a general and now we're gonna need the legislature to be much more directive um, because it hasn't, it hasn't worked as well. It's also sometimes harder in this virtual environment. It, it is great for a lot of people, particularly our rural folks. It's been a game changer, but it is harder for some folks. So for folks with developmental and intellectual disabilities who, to talk about problems with host homes when they're likely making the call or being on a Zoom from a host home with the person right there, probably not gonna feel terribly safe to talk. Um, it's just like with employees, like union meetings don't happen in the boss's office, you know, they, they meet outside. So when people don't have the power to do that on their own, there needs to be extra effort taken to make sure that there's some safety. And so we're trying to figure out how to make that happen. Um, but involved, but being involved in a work group is, it can't ever hurt. Um, and it's definitely something that needs to happen. And I think this would have been better had we had more people on our side involved. Um, and you can go to the so more specifically, um, you wanna understand exactly what you're asking them to do or not do or to stop doing. Um, you have to make sure that you understand if they actually have the authority or not. An example with that is when we were doing all of the case management rules, a lot of us were saying, hey, for people who are don't have any risk factors, like we don't have a cognitive disability, we're stable, we, we have the ability to make our own decisions. Can we not have to have an assessment in our home every year? Can we just fill out a survey or something? And the state came back and, and gave us proof that there was a federal requirement that they did have to do an in-person home visit and that CMS, the federal government is actually requiring more. So, okay, so that means I'm gonna stop pushing on that because if, I, if that's a really big deal, I need to deal with that on the federal level there's bigger fish to fry on the federal level. So we're, we'll just suck it up and deal with it. Um, we're, um, but what they do have the authority to do is to enforce the home visit requirement for the people that really need it, because we are seeing a lot of people that have really suffered over the pandemic when they didn't have them and where someone needs to have eyes on them. And there's still, a lot of them are still not doing it and wanting to do it on Zoom. And so we can't, they, they do have the authority to enforce that rule. Um, we need to learn who the decision maker is, and it's often not the staff that is working on the rule. Now, you have to work with those staff. Like, you don't want to say, oh, I'm not talking to you because you're not the decision maker. It's a bit, it's annoying because they'll often say, oh, we have to take this back and take that back. You work with them in a group, and then at some point, you have to say, we want the decision maker to come talk to us. That's not going to be right at the beginning. But you have to learn who is the decision maker. It's going to be a, um, a manager, high level manager, sometimes an executive director, and ultimately often the rulemaking board. But the boards often will follow. We've gotten boards to go against an agency desire, but you have to have a really good reason and you have to show that you've really tried to work with the agency to get that to happen. And you can't do that on everything. You have to really pick your battles because if you, if every single meeting you're going saying, don't do this, don't do that, they're going to tune you out. If once in a while you come and say, hey, here's all the ways we tried to work with the state, they're moving forward in a way that we think is destructive. Here's why um, you can get, you can get them, um, but you have to have that credibility. Um, 
And again, you want to lobby the decision makers, um, the agency decision makers and the boards, but you have to work through the staff. So you can't, if, if you just show up and you haven't worked with the staff, you haven't gone to any meetings, you're just, you have every right to do that. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say like, you always have a right, you, any, any board, any government board, you have a right to public comment. Um, so I'm not saying anything other. I'm just saying, if you want to be taken seriously, you really have to show that you've tried to work within the system. Um, and go to the next one. Quickly on the day, I said, join a board. Well, what does that mean? So there's two types of boards. Or there's more than two types, but two basic types. So a type one board with there are very few of them. Those are rulemaking boards. Those boards have authority to adopt regulations. Type two boards are more advisory. They're also like committees, task forces, ad hoc stuff. When, so I'm talking appointed boards. Um, in this, and you, again, you'll get this and you'll get the link. It'll give you a link to both the application for boards and commissions, which you can do online, and then a list of all of the boards and commissions. Um, if you have a question about a certain board, if you're looking at it saying, is this a good board? We can tell you there's some boards that are good beginner boards. They're good boards if you don't have a lot of experience to just get the experience of being on a board. There are other boards where it's better to have someone that has more experience um, we also will provide kind of guidance and mentoring to people who can get on boards. Sometimes when they're doing these appointments, it's very specific. So it might be, um, you know, this is a position for um, a, a Democrat who lives in Congressional District 4 who has experience with providing health care. It might be that specific. So you've got to find someone that fits all of those things. Um, or it might be, you know, we need a, you know, so often where they, they struggle is like a Democrat in a Republican district or a Republican in a Democratic district. Independents are kind of easier, but which is many Coloradans. So again, like we need a Republican in Congressional District 1. Well, there aren't that many. So, um, you know, but, but they often are very, very specific like that. We have gotten in law that they have, that they're supposed to have people representing disability on Human services, healthcare policy, and financing, and housing. Um, the problem is they get to kind of decide who that is. We haven't, you know, we we always say. I think something we've learned is to more specifically say someone who is involved with the disability community, because it's not just having a disability and they don't talk to anyone, but who can represent and who can represent broader than their own perspective. Um, but we also give training on how to be on boards and commissions. Um, we have a whole training on that. And we also have a group that meets quarterly for everyone that is representing CCDC or the broader disability community on a board or commission, where just to get together and share what's happening, what's going on, if someone needs like support, you know, because it can sometimes be isolating if you're the only one. And so we have that just for support and just so that people kind of know what each other are doing. Um, and people seem to like that meeting. Um, Next slide. So wrap up, um, and I have two minutes. So one, everyone can be involved in rulemaking. Identify the issue you care about, and you will find a rule. You will find a body to be involved. You can sign up to figure out what agency it is. You can sign up for alerts on the door website. So, for example, I have health or something like that in my. I get every notice. So that means I get everything about Medicaid. I also get stuff about like water that um, again, I care, but I'm, I'm not gonna go to like a water board meeting. So like you, you can just delete those. Um, so sign up for something broad. Um, look at, are there existing rules that you wanna change or is there no rule? And again, we're happy to help people if they have a specific question, figure that out. Find out who's in charge and ask to be invited to the work group. Um, read the existing laws and regulations. And again, ask for help if you need to understand what can and can't be changed in the process. Cause sometimes it can take a lot of digging and we might be able to answer your questions. You know, oh, you know, that's a federal reg, you know, for example, we're not gonna change in Colorado what SSI counts as income, that's federal. So, um, so, you know, we, we can usually tell you what is fed, what, what's something that is really federal. And it's not that we don't get involved in federal. We actually, um, there's some important federal rules that just came out that mirrored a lot of our comments and a lot of what we've done in Colorado, but it is a much longer laborious process. The 
a lot of the rules that are coming out are things that started when Biden took office and they're just coming out now. Um, that's how, that's an example of how long it can take. So, and some of them haven't even been published yet. So, um, so the federal government is slower than, um, I'm not Southern, so I don't have any of these good quotes. Like, I, I feel like there should be some quote about slugs or molasses, but very, very slow. So um, we are at, um, yeah, so anyway, we appreciate you all coming. If you have questions, you can feel free to reach out. Um, and so I love seeing this is what I wanna do. Um, and um, I'm, I'm trying to go through um, all of these comments. Um, if, if there are any questions, I'm happy to stay on and answer, but otherwise, thank you. Um, I think I'll stop the recording. But thank you all for um, participating in this.